is an amazing patristics scholar. Now, for those of us who didn't understand Christianity existed before Martin Luther, you've got to go back even a hundred years before that to get to the patristics. Those are the church fathers that, that were the, the early seed of the church, uh, many of them martyrs, many of them scholars, many of them the reasons we understand Jesus as we understand him today. And so this is a man who is steeped in church history. He's steeped in the study of the gospels. He is steeped in educating people. And he has come here tonight from Yonkers, New York on his way to Scotland eventually here uh, to, to teach over there, would you join me in welcoming, in a Texas way, Father John Bear? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, very much for your words, for your invitation, for all of those who've made it possible this evening, and for all of you for coming this evening. Um, as Mark was saying, I spent most of my life, well, I spent the last 25 years in New York, although I've still got the English accent. I used to think, it used to be the case that it made me sound intelligent, but my students are increasingly of the age, whenever they hear an English accent, they think about Disney films. And if you've never noticed, the villain always has an English accent. <laughs> so I've gone from being intelligent to being a villain. We'll see what happens. Um, as Mark mentioned, I spent most of my life studying the Church Fathers. From the early centuries, I started in the second century, I made my way up to about the fourth or fifth century, then I got pulled back earlier, and my most recent book is on the Gospel of John. And what I would like to do this evening is to bring together what I've learned from reading the early figures of the church, and then bring that into dialogue with um, scholarship on the Gospel of John, scripture scholarship. So, we all know the Gospel of John, and really, it would be impossible to do theology without it. Indeed, the evangelist is, for the Christian tradition, simply the theologian. The prologue, the opening, opening um, 18 verses in particular, starting with the majesty of the eternity of God, with the word in the beginning, with God and himself God, then moving towards the incarnation, the word becoming flesh, so as to dwell in the world and effect the work of salvation. Though the cross and resurrection is strikingly not mentioned in the prologue, and I'm going to be reflecting on that this evening. The prologue, in simple and beautiful prose, states the key points of theology that theologians thereafter would grapple in the centuries that follow. Trinity, incarnation, salvation. So firm is the image that we have of the Gospel of John and its prologue, that this is the Gospel, proclaiming that Jesus is the incarnate Word of God, that we often miss the fact that this is not the stated aim of the Gospel. The stated aim of the Gospel is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name, 2031. Treating the prologue as if it were the equivalent of the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke has led, however, to some very problematic and very dubious claims, both in scriptural scholarship and theological reflection. Most strikingly is Ernest Kaiserman's conclusion that for the Gospel of John, the passion is, in his words, and I'm quoting him, merely a postscript which had to be included because John could not ignore this tradition, nor yet could he fit it organically into his work. The Christ presented by John for Kaiserman is no longer the humble, unknown Messiah of the synoptics, but he's a divine incarnate Lord, a divine incarnate God, striding over the face of the earth. Resulting, Kaiserman says, in an understanding of incarnation that is little better, again in his words, little better than naive docetism. I mean, really? <laughs> and this of the evangelist to whom we owe the idea of incarnation. He was writing some 60 years ago, but the framework within which he's thinking, incarnation, passion, two different things, is one which surely most of us most of the time think. 
So what is the relationship between incarnation and passion in the Gospel of John? And how can scriptural exegesis, combined with historical study, and in the book um, which came out with Oxford recently, John the Theologian and his Paschal Gospel, I also do a whole philosophical section, how can bringing these together result in a better theological reflection and encounter with the living Lord? So I'm going to begin, first of all, with historical background, and then on this basis turn to the Gospel. Now, what makes Kaiserman's conclusion not only troubling, but actually really bizarre, is the fact that the celebration of Pascha, the celebration of Easter, actually began in the circles around John. All too often, the historical context in which the scriptural scholars treat their texts is a projected one isolated from the historical evidence of how that text was read and received by living flesh and blood readers. In the case of the Gospel of John, this has resulted in the 20th century in some really bizarre and wild conjectures. For instance, that the Gospel was written in Gnostic circles and was treated with suspicion by the mainstream Christian church until Irenaeus was able to wrench it out of the hands of the Gnostics by providing an orthodox reading of it. I mean, really wild theories. The death blow to all of that was delivered by Charles Hill with his study, The Johannine Corpus in the Early Church, some 10 years ago. John is, in fact, really in a very privileged position. Already back in the 19th century, Lightfoot, that eminent Anglican um, scholar and bishop, Lightfoot noted that while Peter and Paul converted disciples and organized communities, John, as he put it, founded a school. That is, those who look back to John as the source of their theological and liturgical tradition to which they adhered. So in the first generation, we have Polycarp of Smyrna, Papias of Hierapolis, Ignatius of Antioch, also slightly to one side. Then we have, in the next generation, Melito of Sardis, Apollinarius of Hierapolis, Polycrates of Ephesus, and above all, Irenaeus of Lyon. This is a school of flesh and blood Christians, not a community constructed from the implied readers of modern literary analysis. This is a historical, factual school. And what is really mind-blowing, in fact, is that it's from this school that we have our earliest evidence for the celebration of Easter, of Pascha. The date of the Christian celebration of Easter was a subject of controversy at the end of the second century, and it's a controversy made more obscure by the way that Eusebius, a church historian in the fourth century, preserves and presents the evidence. It's still a subject of debate today, but scholarly consensus has come to the position that rather than being a deviation, as it seemed to Eusebius in the fourth century, the practice of celebrating Pascha, Easter, on the 14th of Nisan was in fact the original practice. Celebrating on the 14th of Nisan we know it in church history as the date of the quarter decimals. It's a nice fancy word, but all it means is 14. The 14ers. Yeah? They celebrated Easter, Pascha, on the 14th of Nisan. And it is pretty certain that until the middle of the second century, they were the only ones who had an annual feast of Easter. The only ones. Yeah? All the information that we've got the fra- um, about the celebration of Easter in the second century. And I'll mention that it's the Epistula Apostolorum, the Epistle of the Apostles, the fragments of Apollinarius of Hierapolis, Melito's On Pascha, beautiful text, really worth reading, which is in fact the earliest Passover Haggadah that we have, Jewish or Christian. Even the text preserved by Eusebius, although he says they say the opposite thing, all of these texts, which mention the celebration of Easter point to celebrating on the 14th of Nisan. On the other hand, 
evidence for the connection between Sunday and the day of resurrection is really slow to emerge. It's not there in the New Testament texts. We speak about coming together on a Sunday. 1 Corinthians 16.2, Acts 27, perhaps Apocalypse 1.10. When they talk about coming together on a Sunday, it doesn't say we come together to celebrate the resurrection. We just come together. Okay? In the Didache, one of the earliest Christian documents we got, it exhorts Christians to come together, kata kiriakim, usually translated inaccurately as coming together on the Lord's Day to give thanks or to celebrate the Eucharist. And it gives directions about how the Eucharist should be celebrated, but it says nothing about the Passion and Resurrection. Pliny, in his letter, he mentions how Christians gather together first day of the week, says nothing about the resurrection. Only in Barnabas does it begin to appear. Barnabas, sometime in the middle of the second century, he says, we also celebrate with gladness the eighth day in which Jesus also rose from the dead and was made manifest and ascended into heaven. The eighth day is a much more embracing concept than that of the day of the resurrection. We come together on the eighth day in which, by the way, Jesus also rose from the dead. Yeah. Even as late as Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century, in the most explicit testimony we've got to what Christians did when they came together on a Sunday, he says, it is on Sunday, the day of the sun, that we all make assembly in common since it is the first day on which God changed darkness and matter and made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior also rose on the same day. Yeah? It's, a, it's, it's an addition, it's a secondary thought. They come together on the Lord's day, like a Christianized Sabbath, the day of rest, the first day, the eighth day. Only later does it become associated with the resurrection. Whereas the disciples of John, the school of John, are celebrating the, 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 the passion, the crucifixion and resurrection on the 14th of Nisan, whatever day of the week it is. Okay. So with this being all the information we have, it is really striking how strong the evidence is we have for the celebration of Easter on the 14th of Nisan, the school of John. Okay. Now two further points should be noted about this. Firstly, it is not a celebration of the passion of Christ, understood as the crucifixion, as distinct from the resurrection, as if they're different things. The Pascha of Christ, Easter, at least in this period, is a single night celebration. And it embraces all aspects, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension, and even Pentecost all together in one feast. And in that, that's something which actually goes back to the Gospel of John. John Ashton, in his book um, on the Gospel of John, it's a really wonderful book, I find it very inspiring. He says, and John is really playing on the word in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, about my servant would be lifted up and exalted. He says, John, John Ashton says, in the first half of the Gospel, John had used the word to lift up to suggest that Jesus' exaltation is conditional upon and contained in his death. He's lifted up on the cross. He's lifted up upon the cross in glory. And then he carries on, so that the passion and resurrection must be viewed as a single happening. And then the, he says the expression from the cross, he hands over the spirit, he hands over the cross, the spirit from the cross, Ashton says, allows him to fuse Easter and Pentecost as well, hinting there's no need to think of the latter, Pentecost, as a separate event. It's all together in one. These are all different aspects of the singular event. In the centuries to come, they come to be celebrated as different events, and we now all think of them as separate events. But initially, they're a single event. Think of it as pure white light, which you put through a prism and you get a spectrum of colors. Yeah? It is really only after Constantine, when you've got a Christianized city, that you can have a whole liturgy of space and time. 
You can go here for the entry into Jerusalem, here for the foot washing, here for the crucifixion, here for the burial, here for the ascension. You couldn't do that before. It starts with a single event, pure white light. Through time, it goes through a prism and becomes the separate events, but they are all aspects of that single event. They all hold together in Christ's act of trampling down death by death. He conquers death by his death. Okay, that's the first point. It's a singular event. The second point regards John himself. Polycrates of Ephesus, one of those who defended this practice of celebrating Easter on the 14th of Nisan, he wrote a letter to Victor in Rome saying, I'm never going to do anything differently, whatever you say. And then he refers to John as being the one who lay on the Lord's breast and who was a priest wearing the petalon. The petalon is a gold leaf with the, Lord's, with the name of the Lord on it, which the high priest in the temple would only wear on the Day of Atonement, one day a year. Polycrates is saying, John the Evangelist was a priest wearing the petalon. What on earth do we make of that? Richard Baucom in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, he's very emphatic, he says, Polycrates is stating as clearly and precisely and as unambiguously as possible that John officiated as a high priest in the Jerusalem temple. That's what Polycrates is saying. But what on earth do we make of it? Some have tried to argue that it really does preserve an accurate historical memory. After all, look at the Gospel of John. John is known to those in the temple. It's on his word that Peter's allowed to enter. But to say he was actually the high priest in the temple in that year, really strong, probably not plausible. Others have argued that, it, that Polycrates is just speaking in a very loose or metaphorical sense, in the way that all Christians, according to 1 Peter, are said to be priests, a royal priesthood but that doesn't do justice to Polycrates' very specific assertion. He doesn't just say John was a priest, he says he wore the petalon. Richard Baucom, most recently, suggests that this is an instance of what he calls an exegetical procedure. And by that he means the conflation of various figures with the same name, which often happens in early Christianity. In this case, he thinks that Polycrates is conflating the John who wrote the gospel with the John mentioned in Acts chapter 4, who's of a high priestly family. He just put the two together and draw the conclusion. There's no doubt that such conflations were made, but it doesn't explain why Polycrates went the extra step. He doesn't say simply that John was a, of a high priestly family. He says he wore the petalon in Jerusalem. That is such an extraordinary statement. So Polycrates, uh, Richard Baucom, calls his interpretation exegetical. But it's clear he's working primarily in historical key. He's looking for historical information about the author of the gospel and possible conflation. But there's another approach, equally exegetical, but taking its lead from the gospel of John itself, rather than turning to Acts. And this, I would say, is a theological exegetical interpretation. And we get to this by asking the fundamental question, well, what is the temple in the Gospel of John? The high point of the Gospel, if not its conclusion, Christ says, it is finished, John 19.30, his last word on the cross, it is finished, I'm going to come back to that repeatedly, the high point of the gospel is the crucifixion of Jesus at the very moment that the lambs are slain on the 14th of Nisan. Or rather, the very moment when the lamb is slain. Interpreting this act by the scriptural injunction that not a bone of his shall be broken. This is, moreover, indicated from the beginning when Christ invites the Jews to destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it up. As the evangelist explains, he spoke, of course, of the temple of his body. 
And finally, it is of course only in the Gospel of John that one of the disciples remains at the foot of the cross along with the mother of Jesus. And that is the disciple whom Jesus loved, who as a uniquely privileged eyewitness is able not only to bear witness, but to be a true witness. Moreover, as Mary Coley puts it in her book on the, the, the temple in John, the title affixed to the cross in the Gospel of John is Jesus the Nazorian, with an O, not the Nazarene, the Nazorian. And she argues that points back to the prophecy of Zechariah as it was read at the time of Christ. And that's on your sheet. You should all have a, a quotation sheet. I've got a number of quotations so that you can see what I'm alluding to. So in Zechariah 6, the word of the Lord that came to the prophet includes the instruction. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it upon the head of Joshua. Now remember, if you're reading in Greek, you'd read Jesus, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the man, we're gonna come back to that behold the man, that behold the man whose name is Branch, for he shall grow up in his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And there shall be a priest by his throne and peaceful understanding shall be between them both. So as such, given the imagery used in the Gospel of John, we have to say the temple is Christ's body. Which is a much, so instead of thinking of the temple as being the, the stone building in Jerusalem, the temple is Christ's body. And his body is a much more embrasive reality. It includes all those in whom Christ promised that he and his father would come to make their home, their ekos. Ekos is another word for temple in the Septuagint. Okay, so the temple in the Gospel of John is Christ's body. The lamb is Christ himself. And the high priest is John standing by the cross when the lamb is slain and the temple is constructed. So, so far is it not the case that the passion was for John merely a postscript which he had to include but couldn't really figure out how or why, but that John was in fact regarded by his school as being the high priest ministering at the Paschal mystery and starting this feast of Easter. That this Paschal mystery, Easter, is completed at the cross, it is finished, Teteliste, enables us to see just how different the Gospel of John is from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics. In a very real sense, John begins where the synoptics conclude. And I don't mean, here's Matthew, here's Mark, here's Luke, oh, here's John. No, I don't mean that. What I mean is that the synoptics conclude, for instance, in Luke 24, with the scriptures being opened to show how Moses and the prophets had spoken of how it was necessary that the Christ should suffer to enter into his glory, and the bread is broken, so that the disciples now finally have their eyes open to recognize Christ. And of course, as soon as they recognize him, he's gone. He disappears from sight because we become his body. I'll return to that later. John, on the other hand, that's how the synoptics finish, scriptures are opened. John starts that way. He starts with a string of really surprising statements at the very beginning of the narrative of his gospel. So as Jesus steps onto the page in the narrative of the gospel, you have the Baptist pointing out Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, 129. And then within a few verses, you have Andrew tells Simon, we found the Messiah, the Christ, right at the beginning. And then Philip tells Nathanael, we found the one about whom Moses and the prophet spoke. And then Nathanael tells Jesus, you are the King of Israel, 
So they really, the Gospel of John starts where the synoptics end. With the recognition you get at the end of the synoptics, that's where John starts. And then Christ replies to all of that by saying, you think that's great? You'll see greater things than these. You'll see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You see even more than what you've seen there. Yeah? And have you ever wondered why the angels ascend than descend? Don't angels descend before ascending? Yeah? Here they ascend and then they descend. Why? Come back to that, maybe. <laughs> okay. So the high point of John's gospel is the construction of the temple and the sacrifice of the lamb with John as a high priest. And then, unlike the synoptics, John plots the narrative of his gospel in a framework measured by the feasts celebrating the temple. In the synoptic gospels, they only mention Passover as a setting for Christ's passion. Luke also mentions that his parents went up to Jerusalem every year for the Passover, but nothing more than that. John, however, indicates no less than six different feasts during the course of Christ's life. And you've got that on your sheet. That's uh, the second block of quotations. So you've got first the Passover of the Jews, which is at hand so that Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. Second, you've got a feast of the Jews. Jesus again goes up to Jerusalem. This feast of the Jews is the only term of the use feast without an article. No other indication is given to what feast it is, but it does mention a Sabbath. Third, you've got a second mention of the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, being at hand. This time, Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem, but is beside Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. He crosses over to Capernaum in the evening. Fourth, you've got the Feast of the Jews, the Tabernacles. So he's plotting the whole of the Gospel. The time references are to the feasts. Yeah? Um, the Feast of the Jews is the, tabernac the Tabernacles. When Jesus went up to Jerusalem, he says, not publicly, but in private. And then you've got a reference to the middle of the feast and the last day of the feast, the great day. Then apart from the healing of the blind man on the Sabbath, which really should be with the fourth one, there's no further indication of time until 1022, when it says the feast of the dedication in Jerusalem. The fifth feast to be mentioned, during which Jesus was walking the temple in the portico of Solomon, and then after this feast, Jesus returned to the place where he first began his ministry, never to return to the temple again. Then finally, you have the sixth feast, the third and final Passover. It, it, it was near, is six days away, is a point before which Jesus eats with his disciples, speaks with them, prays to the Father, knowing that his hour had come to depart out of this world. And then, at the day of preparation for the Passover, about the sixth hour, he's crucified. Then, after these six temporal and festal indications, there comes as seventh, the temporal markers of his appearance to Mary Magdalene on the first day of the week, to the disciples without Thomas on the evening of that day, so still first day of the week, and then eight days later, to the disciples with Thomas. So you've got six feasts, for four of which Jesus is in the temple, culminating in his crucifixion on the day of preparation, followed by a new beginning with the risen Christ on the first day and the eighth day. He doesn't mention the third day, first day and eighth day. Clearly, John has arranged his presentation of Christ in a highly sophisticated manner, and a highly liturgical manner. Moreover, five of these six feasts are also connected with the actions and words that identify Christ as a temple and the fulfillment of the feasts in them. So the first mention of Passover is a setting for Christ to talk about the temple that he would raise up in three days, his body. The second mention of Passover in chapter six leads to a discussion on the following day about the bread of life, that descends from heaven and is his flesh. I'm going to come back to that. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Christ identifies himself as the living water. And then early in the following morning, the light of the world, the key themes for the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And then at the Feast of Dedication, it is Christ, not the temple, who is consecrated by the Father, 1036. And then finally at the Passion, Christ is presented as the temple. Moreover, the sequence from the second, the chapter five, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, to his final departure from the temple in 1040, begins with the weekly Sabbath, and then proceeds through the liturgical year. Passover in the first month, tabernacles in the seventh, dedication in the ninth. It's completely liturgically oriented. There's no need to rearrange the chapters as Bultmann did to try and make more geographical sense out of it. The order's not geographical, the order's liturgical. Moreover, now that the temple is complete, its sacrifice is one of love. In John, although Christ is introduced by the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, in John, the passion, when uh, Christ's act of laying down his life is presented not as an atonement, but simply as an act, or rather the act of divine love. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. This is the way God loves the world. This is the expression of love. So in the Gospel of John then, um, Christ asserts that Moses wrote of me. And so John has looked back to Exodus, where having been instructed in seven speeches of the Lord in Exodus about what he was to build, Moses finished all the work and the cloud covered the tent of witness, which in Greek is tinskini to martyriu, the skinny, the dwelling place of witness, but also martyrdom, I'll come to that. And the tent was filled with the glory of the Lord, such that Moses could not enter it because the tent was filled with the glory of the Lord, Exodus 40. Now, however, we know that what Moses built was but a copy of what he saw on the mountain, the true tabernacle of witness, the true tabernacle of martyria, the glory of the Lord is Christ himself. Okay, so John's looked back to Exodus to see what Christ has finished, to tell his day, it's finished. But John is not just looking back to Genesis, uh, to, 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 ex, to Moses, uh, he's, not, he's not only looking back to this book of Moses, Exodus, it's clear from the opening of his gospel, he's also looking back to Genesis. As soon as you read the first words of the gospel, in the beginning, what do you think? Genesis. Good. So he alerts us at the very beginning that he's playing off Genesis. Now, to appreciate how he's playing off Genesis, we should note that the school of John had a very particular idea about what it is to be a human being. And I've given you quotation number three. This is Ignatius of Antioch. At the beginning of the second century, he's on his way to Rome to be martyred, and he writes to the Christians in Rome saying, whatever you do, don't interfere with my coming martyrdom. But look how he says it. Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Suffer me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I will be a human being. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. He's not yet born. Birth pangs are upon me. He's not yet living. He's telling the Roman Christians, whatever you do, don't try and get me out of my martyrdom. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die by keeping me from my martyrdom. He's not yet born, he's not yet living, and he's not yet human. When I will have arrived there, I'll be a human being. The things that we think about ourselves immediately undercut. Aren't we born into life as human beings? Isn't that what we are? No, we've got to be martyred for that. You can make similar points from Melito and from Irenaeus and so on. So what is finished um, on the cross in the Gospel of John is the work of God, not only in Exodus, but in Genesis. So think back to Genesis. Scripture begins in Genesis with God issuing commands. Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let the earth bring forth living creatures. This divine let there be, this divine fiat, an imperative let there be, is sufficient to bring everything into existence. 
And it was so, and it was good, end of the day, next day. But then having spoken everything into existence by a word alone, setting the stage, as it were, God, not with an imperative, but with a subjunctive, announces his own project. So having said, let there be, let there be, let there be, he then says, let us make. Let us make the human being in our image and our likeness. That's the only thing which God deliberates about. It's the only thing which is said to be his purpose and his resolve. With scripture opening with this announcement of the particular project of God, we can now hear a further dimension to Christ's last word from the cross in the Gospel of John. It is finished. Not simply it's finished, it's come to an end, but it's finished, it's brought to completion, it's brought to perfection, it's perfected. And this is something which is confirmed only in the Gospel of John, unwittingly, by Pilate. Scripture starts off with, let there be, let there be, let there be, let us make a human being. At the Passion, the Gospel of John, behold the human being, idu or anthropos, eke homo. So the particular project of God to create a human being in his image and likeness is not accomplished simply by a divine fiat, let there be a human being, then and there. It depends rather upon the fiat of Christ, let it be, not my will but thine, and then those like Ignatius, who also in Christ give their own, let it be, let it be. Ignatius, let me go to my martyrdom, let me follow Christ, let me follow in his footsteps through the passion, and I too will be born into life and I will become a human being. You can see intimations of this throughout the Gospel of John, for instance, in the healing of the blind man or in John 5. We're not going to go into that now. You can get my book. Um, but, the mo- but I want to do the mo- focus on the most intriguing one, and that's the appearance of the woman. The woman is a figure in the Gospel of John who ties together the beginning, the middle, and the end. And it, she also ties the Gospel to the Apocalypse. She appears at Cana, when Jesus' hour is not yet. She wants the water, turn, uh, water, they're running out of wine, she approaches her son, and Christ says, woman, woman, no, not mother, woman, what have you to do with me? My hour is not yet. Okay, she appears at the beginning, and then she appears at the end when the hour has come. Okay, this is quotation number four on your sheet. And it's, it's worth paying close attention because it's interesting how the vocabulary sh- shifts across the verses. This is John 19, his words from the cross. Okay? It, it goes like this. So he says, so the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw the mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to the mother, woman, behold your son. Okay? Now most English translations translate it all as his mother. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. When Jesus saw his mother, he said to his mother. But it's not that in Greek. It's standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. So when it takes the evangelist perspective, he's describing the scene, he says his mother. When Jesus looks at her, so when we take Jesus' perspective, it's the mother, and when he addresses the mother, he addresses her as woman. The hour has come, he addresses her as woman, and now we've got the language also of behold your son. Okay? Now between the beginning and the end, my hour is not yet, woman, what have you to do with me? The end, woman, behold your son. You've also got the words in John 16, the words of consolation as Christ is about to depart. And again, the vocabulary is really, really interesting. So look at it, it's on your sheet, quotation number five. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When the woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come, But when she's delivered of the child, the word there is child, she no longer remembers the tribulation, 
for joy that a human being is born into the world, anthropos, okay? Most other, most translations translate that for joy that the baby is born into the world, or the infant's born into the world, but it's not. It goes from infant to human being, yeah? So you will have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. So you've got this transition from the birth of a child to the birth of a human being born into the world. But there's more in it. Look at it again. When the woman is in travail, she has sorrow. Really? Really? Is that the word you use for when a woman's in childbirth? Sorrow? That's the word you use when you're grieving. It's not the, the word which you'd use for childbirth that comes later. She no longer remembers a tribulation. Yeah? It's sorrow. So is this a birth or is it a death we're talking about? Yeah? And we're talking about the death which is to come, Christ's own death, when he says, woman, behold your son. Okay? Or is it a death which is a birth, like it is with Ignatius? Allow me to be born into life so that I too can become a human being. Okay? So it's a birth into life as a human being which comes about through the cross so that Christ in the final instance is the human being and the woman is the one to whom he says, woman, behold your son. Now there are further parallels with Genesis that are being played out in the crucifixion scene. And here we move from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. According to Paul, Adam is a type of the one to come, a figure of the one to come, a sketch, a preliminary model of the one to come. Okay, Romans 5.14. And so Adam's sleep foreshadows Christ's death. Irenaeus and Tertullian already comment on this at the end of the second century. Adam is put to sleep, Christ is put to sleep. Eve comes from the side of sleeping, the sleeping Adam, the rib built up into a woman, and so too the church in the form of blood and water comes forth from the side of Christ in mortal slumber. The woman in Genesis 3 is promised sorrow, that word again, sorrow in childbirth, just as is a woman in Genesis, uh, John 16. And when Eve finally gives birth, it is in Genesis 4.1, a human being she acquires from God. Just as a human being is born in 1620, John 16.21. However, although Adam calls the woman Eve, Zoe, life in the Septuagint, he calls the woman Eve because she's a mother of the living, all her children in fact die, for which the word sorrow rather than travail is more appropriate. So the church in fact turns out to be the true mother of the living, but to be a living member of the church, to be born through the mother church, to become alive, you have to die. Baptism and so on, yeah? So the church is, as Paul says, our mother, just as Christ is a true human being and Adam is a type, Eve is a type of, of the, the mother church. She acquires as living human beings those who following Christ are born through martyric death, anticipated by baptism, and all one can say about that. And there's one further tie between Genesis 2 and 3 and the Gospel of John. When God leaves Eve to Adam. Remember, God builds, takes a rib, builds up a woman, and leads her to the man, to her spouse, Adam. The only way Adam has been identified so far is as clay made from the earth, modeled, breath of life, and placed in the garden to work it. So who would Eve have thought Adam to be? The gardener. Just as when Mary approaches the risen Christ, she thinks he's the gardener, yeah? And is comforted with the words, weep no more. Okay, all those themes that you have in John playing with Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in these ways, so that what is finished is not only the temple, but the living human being, the woman, the church, all those kind of things, are also then picked up in the apocalypse as Peter Leithart has recently demonstrated so brilliantly in his commentary on the apocalypse, the apocalypse which speaks of the church as the woman, 
who when her child was taken up into heaven, flees into the wilderness, awaiting the preparation of those martyrs who become conformed to her son. So that at the end of the apocalypse, the wedding feast that's announced at the beginning of the gospel is finally consummated. So when you don't read John followed by Acts, Acts after all follows Luke, but when you read John and the Apocalypse together, it turns out to be a two-part royal romance. Announcement of a wedding, the bridegroom, the preparation of the bride, the consummation of the wedding. So the gospel of the theologian, John, encompasses the beginning and the end of all the work of God as Christ's it is finished brings to completion God's own purpose, the living human being, the glory of God, the unity of flesh and spirit in the living human being when the spirit adorns the flesh with its own properties so that it's not simply one flesh but becomes one spirit with the Lord. That's a final marriage celebrating the Paschal Feast. Okay, so far we've looked at what John is doing with the Passion. And clearly he's doing a lot, and it's just bypass um, Ernest Kaiserman completely. He's got no room for the passion at all in the Gospel of John, really. What then about incarnation? If you're willing, to, it's, it's coming up to eight, if you're willing to bear with me for 10 minutes, I'd like to talk about incarnation. Okay. What do we make of incarnation, especially the prologue in the verse 14, the word became flesh? Now, a preliminary point should be made. Should be made. And that is that our tendency today is to start with, because we know Christian theology and we know Trinity, we know incarnation, because we start and we know all of these things, we think, our tendency is to start with a second person of the Trinity who happens to be called the Word, and then we come to verse 14 and we think this is a pre-incarnate Word becomes flesh, we bring that together with Matthew and Luke to talk about how he's born of Mary. Although Matthew and Luke don't mention the word, and John 1.14 doesn't speak about a birth. In fact, it's only in verse 13 that a birth is mentioned, and that's the birth as a child of God for all those who receive him. Now, the school of John, and in fact the tradition for centuries thereafter, all held very clearly that the term word, logos, is a title of Jesus. It's not the name before he was incarnate in a biography of the word. It's a title of the one Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one. For instance, quotation number six. Irenaeus is the first commentary we've got on the prologue of John. He's refuting his opponent's interpretation. He says, manifest then is a false fabrication of their exegesis. For John proclaiming one God, the Almighty, and one Jesus Christ, the only begotten. Okay, the subject is the one Jesus Christ, by whom all things were made, declared that this is the word of God. Yeah, it's John, the, Jesus Christ, this is the word of God. This the only begotten. This the maker of all things. This the true light who enlightens everyone. This the maker of the world. This is the one who came to his own. This the one who became flesh and dwelt among us and they misunderstand it. Okay, you can read the rest of the quotation yourself later. So Irenaeus clearly and emphatically reads the whole of the prologue as being about Jesus Christ. He is the word in the beginning, with God, and everything thereafter speaks about him. Jesus becomes flesh. And I say, that's the way it's ubiquitous in early Christianity, up to and including the creeds, the creed of Nicaea, for instance. I believe in one God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't even use the term word, but it's the one Lord Jesus Christ who's begotten from the Father before all ages. One subject. So in my book, I give a full analysis of the whole prologue, which I've given to you at the bottom of the back side of the page, the reverse side. And I analyze it as um, three paschal hymns, three hymns celebrating Easter. So it's, it, it's not an anomaly that the cross is not mentioned there. It is all about the cross and resurrection. So look at the first verse. This is how I do it. But I want to get to verse 14 and focus on that. Okay? So in the first verse, in first place, enarchi, 
Arche doesn't really mean beginning. It means in first place. It's translated into Latin as in principium, not in initium. In first place was and is a crucified Jesus, the Word. The Word was and is going towards God. It's prostantheon, going towards. Yeah? In the Gospel of John, Jesus is going to, going to the Father all the way through. I'm going to the Father, but not yet. I'm going to the Father, not yet. All the way through the Gospel, he's going towards God. And then, and the Word was and is God. The conclusion of John's Gospel. Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God. So the first verse is a summary of the whole gospel. Okay? Verse two to five, four is all, uh, two to five, is all, there should be five there, is also a summary of the whole gospel. This one, this crucified risen Lord, was and is in the first place towards God. All things came to pass through him, without him nothing came to pass. Many people have in fact argued that it should be all things came to pass through him, rather than all things were created by him. And there's good Greek reasons for that. It's eienito, not ktizo, and it's panda, not tapanda. And the real point of this is that in the Gospel of John, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, everything happens by the will of Christ. I lay down my life when I'm ready. You know, when I'm ready, I will do this. Everything happens by him. Without him, nothing came to pass. And what came to pass in him was life. And the life was the light of human beings, the light shines in darkness, the darkness has not overcome it. Again, a summary of the whole gospel. Then verse six to 18, also a summary of the whole gospel. This time it's chiastically structured rather than steps. Okay, so verse six, seven, and eight are about the Baptist. There was a human being sent from God whose name was John, for he came for testimony to Martin to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came bear witness to the light. And then 15 to 18 at the bottom, John bore witness to him and cried, this is he, and he carries on. Okay, so John the Baptist giving witness and witness at the end. Uh, verse nine, the second one in, that was a true light which enlightens every human being coming into the world. The human being coming to the world, the same phrase as in John 16 the human being coming into the world, okay? And then the high point is, he was in the world, the world came to be through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own, his own received him not. He's rejected, he's, he's abandoned on the cross. But it carries on. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and tabernacled in us, full of grace and truth, we've beheld his glory, glory is the only begotten son from the Father. John 1.14, what does it mean to say he becomes flesh? Almost invariably, commentators have assumed that flesh is simply human nature, meat. Yeah, you know, what we are, just simple as that, yeah? Um, but the question really is, how does the Gospel of John use it? So you've got three or four occasions when, when John or Jesus says something like to the Pharisees, you judge according to the flesh, okay? Human standard. But then you've got the whole of John 6, where he tells you what his flesh is. A whole chapter, which is a meditation by Christ himself on what his flesh is. Most strikingly, quotation, that shouldn't be 87, that should be quotation seven on your sheet there, from John 6, 51 to 56. I am the living bread which descended from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give you, future tense, for the life of the world, is my flesh. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. That change in the first line there from I am the living bread which descended, past tense, to the bread which I shall give you, future tense, indicates that Jesus must become the flesh that he will be able to give to his disciples. Jesus, when he says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not saying, you know, pull my arm off and have a good gnaw, or catch your blood and have a drink of it. That would be cannibalism, yeah? And even if that's what he meant, only those there on the day could have done it, 
wouldn't help many others. Yeah? So when he's talking about the flesh, it is that which he will give, future tense, which he will give through the passion as a living bread which descends from the heaven, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, whom he already and always is in the Gospel of John. So he ascends the cross to become the flesh. And his ascent of the cross is paralleled by the descent of the living bread, the Son of Man descending from heaven to offer us his flesh and blood. And notice there, it is ascent followed by descent. Remember the angels? They don't descend, then ascend. They ascend, then descend. This is where we see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, um, and this is the way that writers in the early church took it. So look at quotation number eight from Cyril of Alexandria, so even fifth century. Here too, we should especially admire the holy evangelist for crying out explicitly, the word became flesh. He did not say, hesitate to say, not that he became in the flesh, but he became flesh in order to show the unity. So whoever eats of the holy flesh of Christ has eternal life because the flesh has in itself the word who is life by nature. For this reason, he says, I'll raise him up in the last day. The flesh that he becomes in John 1.14 is a flesh that we can eat. Yeah? So going back to the structure of the verse, the, ba- uh, the Baptist at the beginning and the end, uh, the B, verse nine and, and verse 12 is, he's a true light, he's in the world, the world rejected him, but to those who received him, he gave the power to become children of God, and he became flesh and tabernacles in us so that we see his glory, the glory which he reveals on the cross. Okay, just to wrap up then. So far then, is it not the case that incarnation has so overshadowed everything else in the Gospel of John that there's no place for the passion, but rather the whole Gospel is focused upon leads up to and culminates in the passion, in the words of Christ, it is finished, the temple is complete, the human being is revealed, this is the work of God. It's not the case that the incarnation has overshadowed everything else, there's no room for the passion. In fact, it's a completion, the passion is a completion of the whole thing, and incarnation, likewise, is not simply an event in the past, now 2,000 years ago, but an ongoing reality that includes believers now, for they are the body of Christ, the temple of the living God. Thank you. Um, what do you think of Richard Balcom's view that the John who wrote the gospel is not the son of Zebedee? I agree. Simple. <laughs> um, th- th- there's the issue. Uh, it's a contested issue. And it's been contested since at least the fourth century. Um, that the John who wrote the gospel and the apocalypse, that's where I disagree with Richard Balcom, is a different John than John, the son of Zebedee, who appears in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay? And the reason I find most persuasive for that is the writing of Irenaeus. So Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, was a disciple of John. Whenever Irenaeus writes about the writer of the gospel, he does so in really loving, grandfatherly terms. Yeah? He does it as um, the beloved John, the disciple of the Lord, the one who lay in the breast of the disciple of the Lord, and all, all this kind of language. Whenever he refer, and he never refers to him as an apostle or the son of Zebedee. When he refers to John, the son of Zebedee, it's simply as a character that's appearing in the synoptics. And he never uses the titles like lay on the Lord's breast or the disciple of the Lord for John, the son of Zebedee. He keeps the two completely apart. Okay. There are, and he was the last one really to do that. Um, Polycrates and Polycarp and others before him do that. Thereafter, the two figures become conflated. And part of the reason for their conflation is a, a, is a obfuscation that Eusebius throws into the question because he wants to discredit the apocalypse, which until that point everybody had accepted was by the same author. Okay.
There we okay. go. Okay. Um, do you believe that the Gospel of John was written out of the area uh, of Ephesus? Uh, I haven't made my mind up on that one. <laughs> I'll persuade you later. What is, uh, or try to. Um, so one person wants some clarification. So in, okay, can you say, we've got to think of Ephesus. We've got this really strong tradition about him uh, being in Ephesus at the end of his life and so yeah, on, yeah? yeah? And we've got a lot of information which in the second century about how he appeared and gathered all his disciples around him. And they had like a kind of meeting together, yeah? Um, so there's very clearly that, but when, whether, and they urged him to write the gospel, that's how it's reported. So you do yeah, have that. So, so my principal argument, if you think it's got any merit at all, and if you don't, I'll try to convince you later, is, is if you look at the book of Ephesians, which is, is written probably a couple of decades before the, the gospel of John, John actually uses unique language from the epistle of Ephesians yeah. that nobody else uses. Oh, absolutely. The, 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 the closeness between Ephesians, but Paul more generally and John is really striking. Yeah. The language of being in Christ and so on. Right. But there's all sorts of other information. For instance, the Muratonian canon, the, the, the list from the second, mid-second century speaks about the, number, the books of the New Testament and when they were written and so on. It says that Paul wrote seven letters in imitation of his predecessor, John. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, <laughs> Leave that <yeah>. one. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, next question. What is the significance of having a female figure at the beginning, middle, and end? Oh, because John's playing on Genesis. John, John's reading the end in terms of the beginning, the beginning in terms of the end, and you have, um, obviously, Adam, uh, let us make a human being. Here it's complete upon a cross. That's Genesis 1, finishing in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. But then you have in Genesis 2, you have, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah? And people always go immediately to the rib taken from his side. But in fact, when God says it's not good for man to be alone, what, I'll make a helper fit for him. What he does is bring all the animals to him until Adam himself realizes it's not good to be alone. Then when Adam says, where's mine? That's when God puts him to sleep, takes a rib. So, so he, he, he's, he's understanding the, the, the end in terms of the beginning in all these different dimensions. Um, but there's one further passage which has to go together with that, and that is Isaiah 53, um, the hymn of the suffering servant, which is immediately followed by another feminine figure. Rejoice, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into sing, cry aloud, for the children of her that is, uh, for the children of her that is barren is more than the children of her that is married. So the barren woman, as a result of the passion of Christ, says A53, now gives birth to many children. Okay? Uh, which Paul already does in Galatians 4. Okay. And maybe I missed it, but I thought you had set up the link. I'm not sure if you had time to fit it in. So if not, if you want to fit it in. But you set up the link where you were referencing the Nazor. And yeah. yet, Nazor is our, our Hebrew word that, that we've got for the branch itself. Yeah. And, and, and that, there was a connection between how, that, uh, how the passage from Zechariah was read. Exactly. You'd have to look at Mary Coley or my book for details on that. Okay. I can't remember. All that right. But, but that's, that, okay. that's going back to that. Yeah, it's that yeah, passage. Yeah. Yeah, the branch great. builder, the branch, the temple builder. And so with a priest standing by the foot of the cross, that's what I think is going on in the presentation of the Passion, the Gospel of John, as Polycrates is looking back to it with, Jesus, with John as being the high priest. So do you see also any of that linking up also to the, the festival of Sukkot, which you reference in John yeah. 7 and, and 8 with the way they would bring the branches and had very specific rules oh, about yeah. how the branches would... Oh, John, John's, yeah. His gospel is okay. imbued with all of that. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, in John 2, the temple is called My Father's House. In John yeah. 14, the Upper Room Discourse, My Father's House. Yeah. Uh, is John 14 also talking about the body of Christ there? Absolutely. Yeah, and that's also why the question of the washing of the feet. Wash your feet before you go in the house. Uh, here's a really important one. How long until your paperback of Origins Periarchon comes out? <laughs> I think four weeks, January yeah. sometime. <laughs> Not in time for Christmas. <laughs> no, but you can still get the, the John the Theologian. <laughs> when do you date the Gospel of John? Not sure. Um, I'm more inclined now to take the Apocalypse as being written in the 60s. The only reason for dating the apocalypse in the 90s, the only reason is one line in Irenaeus which has been misread. 
when it said that John, it's, it's, it's usually translated, John saw uh, the vision was seen towards the end of the reign of Domitian. But in fact, it was John was seen towards the end of the reign of Domitian. Interesting. That's Interesting. the only rationale for putting it later. So I would place the apocalypse early 60s. So know? sometime shortly after the fall of the temple? Before. Before the Before. fall of the temple. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Interesting. Jesus wasn't... And that's actually a fairly standard position there. Yeah? Yeah. yeah for the apocalypse? Yeah. So you date the gospel after the apocalypse? Well, that's what I'm still trying to work out. But the two... See, uh, Peter Letha... I mean, kind still, of makes it messy for uh, your uh, wedding at the beginning and wedding at so the end. Although what, Star no, Wars, precisely. they did the middle they ones did the middle part, yeah. back. But, but yeah. you know, so when I wrote the book, when I wrote the book on, my book on John, Peter Leithout's commentary hadn't come out yet, and I was treating the relationship between the apocalypse and the gospel in a slightly different way. The apocalypse as being the unveiling, which means that the gospel's the veiling. Well, you okay. definitely need him in your early Christology uh, seminar next time. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I'm not going to ask you that one. I'm not <laughs> going to ask you that one. I'm trying to look for one more. We've got time for one more. I want it to be a good one. Um, not that these are bad. I don't feel like I just passed over yours because it was a stinker. These were all good. Um, eh. <laughs> eh. I'll look at them later. By definition, here's the last okay. one. Um, would you comment, please, on the difference between the time of the Passion and Crucifixion in the Synoptic St. John's Gospel? Yeah, so very simply, um, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, the, lamb, the lambs are slain in the temple, the disciples, Christ and disciples has the Passover meal, and he's crucified the following day. Very clear. Yeah? In, the Synopt in the Gospel of John, he's crucified when the lambs are slain. It's, it's literally it's a different day. Okay. And the point is not that they were confused about chronology or time or whatever else it is. The point is that in the Gospel of John, Christ is already introduced at the beginning with the words of the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. Well, if he's the Lamb of God, when is he going to be slain? It's a theological point that's being made. Okay. Very good. 